So scholarly teaching and the scholarship of teaching and learning. The um, manuscript that um, Deborah mentioned, the precursor or the, the draft of scholarship reconsidered, um, included the idea that the American faculty legitimately could produce four kinds of scholarship. Discovery, which is what is our traditional model, which is going out and finding out something new. Application or practice, which is how something actually works. And you say, oh yeah, that's fine, but why did they have to mention that? That was actually one of the more revolutionary ones. Because about 100 years ago, almost exactly 100 years ago, the Flexner Report came out in the United States that said that medical education needed to be more academic and moved medical education into the university. So the first thing that they did in the university was start doing discovery scholarship instead of application scholarship. They started talking about um, new medicines and went off into a whole area that had nothing to do with patient care. <laughs> um, and so to say that it is legitimate to look in social worker, um, you know, same thing. Um, what is the impact? Let's not just discuss how many angels can dance on the head of a pin. Let's count. Let's go out there and see what actually happens when we take our theories um, out into the world. Integration scholarship is an interesting one, and some of you will be in disciplines that are in need of that, and some of you are not. How many of you are in the hard sciences? Okay, all right. What are your fields? Biology. Bi biology, okay. In biology, are there a lot of conflicting ideas about how things work, or are you pretty settled on, on how it all goes together? So some of them are more up in the air. OK, if you have a field that has a lot of conflicting paradigms in it, and people don't know exactly which concept is the, is the one that they should take, it needs integration. It's ready for people to say, OK, there's this, this, and this. How do we bring that together into a universal theory that we can use in our discipline for a while till more things come up? So some have a very settled discipline and there's no need for integration scholarship. Others, for instance, higher education, could use a bunch of integration. So it depends on the, where your discipline is, whether that would be an appropriate scholarship. And then they said there was a scholarship of teaching. You know, there's no learning on that, just teaching. We learned after that that there is no scholarship of teaching without scholarship of learning. Um, this on which, unfortunately, they made a huge mistake in that particular document. They have a follow-up document that compounded the mistake. They looked at how do you assess the different scholarships. So for discovery, application, and integration, they went to the journals. And they said to the journal editors, how do you determine quality? What do your reviewers look for to make quality in those types of scholarship? And they pulled that all together. But that is not what they did in the scholarship of what they called the scholarship of teaching. They went into the classroom and looked at student evaluations of teaching. I used to hang out in a, a biochem lab at MIT when I was a graduate student wife. And the Navy and the National Science Foundation would come in and see whether they were doing scholarly biochemistry. Did they have the right procedures? Were people trained correctly? Did they keep their data correctly? How did it all work out? That had nothing to do with the scholarship of biochemistry. The scholarship of biochemistry was a product of what they found, peer reviewed, and sent out into the world. And so this was a big mistake looking at this. So we ended up with this confusion. What is good teaching, which of course is what we all want? What is scholarly teaching? And then what is the scholarship of teaching? And as I say, we added learning. Any activity that we do that enables anybody to learn is good teaching. It all depends on the learning. Now, some people are born with a natural gift. Some people will never get it, no matter what they do. But it doesn't matter, because it's not something that we can control. We are educators. We believe that we can educate people to do things. 
what I call scholarly teaching is what you would call scholarship of discovery probably in any other field. You look at what else has been done by other people and you look at what happens when you do something and then you're a scholarly teacher. It feeds back and you try something better. Now that's what I'm saying you're all doing implicitly. You're all going through that cycle of you know, what did you do, what did you hear somebody else did, what did you even read someplace, trying it out, adjusting and doing it again. That is scholarly teaching and it can be documented as I'll show you, but that is not the scholarship of teaching and learning. The scholarship of teaching and learning has two other pieces to it. You have to place what you found back into the knowledge base. You have to let other people know. You present it, you publish it. There's no way that those folks in the biochem lab at MIT found out the structure of a molecule and said, hmm, that's interesting, well, let's do something else tomorrow. They wrote it up, they presented it, they sent it in for publication. It entered the knowledge base so that the next person who wanted to find out what they could do, hi, come on in anywhere, <laughs> um, to find out the structure of rhenium-3 or rhenium-2 could see what was already done in the, um, you know, other like uh, molecules. So that putting it out into the public is one of the two things that makes it actual scholarship and not just scholarly. So what's the relationship between the two? Well, I'm an ongoing cycle person and here's my ongoing cycle and I'm gonna, you don't have to worry about all these little details, but this one, that orange square, what is it that you see that you want to change or that you want to continue? What is something, and I'm a social scientist so I love problems, but the people in the humanities don't like problems, so what is their challenge or their opportunity? Um, what do you see? You have to see something first in order to see if something changes. This is the cycle here. That you go around, and I'll go through this one piece at a time, you look at what other people have done, which we high and mighty call consult the literature. But you just go out, you're going to see what other people have done. You find a learning experience, something that somebody's done that seems like it would be applicable to what you want to do. You try it out, you look at it systematically, you document what you see, you analyze the results, you find out from others how you did, and you check it against the baseline, which of course if you don't have one you can't finish the cycle. So this is the most important piece. This is the hardest piece, and this will lead directly into what can make everything easier. <laughs> 